What if I told you there's more than meets the eye with the sun, the only star in our solar system? This year, we've seen a solar eclipse, and recently, the northern lights have danced around parts of the United States that it normally doesn't. All things involving, if not caused by, the sun and patterns of the sun. So why are these phenomena happening? What is the sun up to, and what are the other consequences of the sun's actions? We're joined by Dan Tommaso, meteorologist at ABC 27, to talk about those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm Sam Chen. If you haven't been paying attention, the sun has been putting on quite a show throughout the United States in 2024. Of course, the solar eclipse reaching totality in many parts of the United States uh, earlier in the spring. And more recently, certain parts of the country saw the northern lights, parts of the country where the northern lights never show up. So what is going on? What is the sun up to? There's no one better to talk about these questions than our friend Dan Tommaso. He is the meteorologist at ABC 27 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Dan, welcome back to Face the Issues, and thank you so much for joining us. Sam, thank you for having me. Glad to be back on the show. And it's been quite an exciting time, whether it's in the meteorological realm of things or astronomical. And this is where kind of the two sciences meet on a regular basis. Um, people turn to meteorologists for the forecast to see such events, but at the same time, there's a lot of astronomy that goes on, and I think it's a wonderful time to educate the public on both meteorology and the atmosphere, and I think it reminds a lot of people there's a lot out there, and if you never paid attention to maybe in your grade school science classes or your high school science classes, these are always good refreshers. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I love that. And I think a lot of people don't even realize that this isn't just weather. This is weather. This is space. I, I'm, I'm a space nut from the time I was a kid. So uh, this, is, this is me geeking out today. I appreciate you joining us and letting me sure. geek out a little bit. Uh, Dan, let's start with the solar eclipse. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone saw those photos with the guys wearing those goofy glasses and <laughs> looking up at the sun. But what, I mean, just for as a refresher, what causes a solar eclipse? So again, let's go back to some of the basics that you have to worry about the orbits to figure out how a solar eclipse works. So the sun itself didn't change, didn't do anything. What the big deal was, even though it's called a solar eclipse, this has more to do with the moon than it does with the sun. And so the moon and the sun obviously are out there in outer space, the sun farthest away, but a very, very large object, much bigger than the moon. And so the moon is like a tiny little golf ball compared to a beach ball that's the sun. And so you have this big beach ball and then you have a small golf ball that eventually get in alignment every 30 to 60 years over one location. Could, he, could even be longer in some cases, but it's, it's not that simple. So essentially the sun's light is penetrating the atmosphere, the sky at all times over where we're sitting on planet Earth, but the moon then has to come in a completely direct path in front of the sun. So the moon essentially for a moment in time or a few moments in time completely blocks out the sunlight from hitting your spot on earth. Now, a lot of people have said, why do we care so much about totality? Well, totality is rare because again, you need that perfect alignment that it's daytime, we're awake, we're able to see it and the sun's shining down on earth and then the moon per perfectly passes in front of the sun at that particular part on Earth. And again, it's not everyone that sees this, but the moon is constantly casting a shadow when it goes in front of the sun at some point. So whether that's over planet Earth, whether that's outer space, that's always the question. So when you finally get that perfect lineup, that perfect blocking of the moon in front of the sun, that's when you could have a partial eclipse or a total eclipse of so totality. And that's when things turn really cool. And it's so interesting, very smart mathematicians Physicists have figured out formulas and geometry to predict exactly down to the minutes where this happens, when it happens across the globe. So the next one, if you miss, if you miss totality this time, maybe there were too many clouds, maybe the conditions weren't right, you have to go to Spain to see the next one. And I believe that's in a few years. So again, everyone across the globe gets to share in this at some point, even over the oceans. There's eclipses. It's just as anyone there to see it. 
And Dan, to that question, we, we saw there's places that had totality in our area. We were off at around 90%. I think Erie hit totality. Mm -hmm. Why do some people get totality, others don't? You mentioned a few years, Spain will get totality, but the United States won't. Correct. So again, you know, the, the moon is so small compared to the sun. So that perfect alignment has to happen. And then a little bit of the geometry is in play too, that the the earth, moon, sun is not on a perfect plane. So that lineup, the sun, the moon, the earth is not on a perfect straight line, if you will. And so it has to exactly line up and the timing of both the earth's orbit around the earth plus the earth's orbit around the sun allows for that difference to take place. And so you have to be at the right place, the right time, and it's not over the entire planet, if you will. So again, because of the sheer size of the sun, it, it takes that perfect placement to make a solar eclipse. Now, there are times where, you know, just a few years ago in 2017, this same area had about a 70 to 75% eclipse. Again, that alignment wasn't quite right here in Pennsylvania, but it was more correct in other parts of the country. And we'll see that over the next 50 to 60 years. If you want to travel, you can go to certain places across the country and see the eclipse. It just won't be as localized. That's what made this one special. Yeah, it seems like many parts of the U.S. saw it this time. Uh, but I remember that 2017 one. And I assume that's also why sometimes they are partial and sometimes they're full. It just depends on where that, that path of blockage comes from. Absolutely. So the path, the path is the important part. So the path of the moon relative to the sun is what you want to follow. And so there are so many cool simulations online. NASA's put out a bunch where you can literally see, and maybe you saw this if you were lucky enough to see the progression of the eclipse, you can see the moon essentially cross in front of the sun and make its way past the sun. So again, if you can kind of visualize that, if you could take, say, um, you know, a flashlight and eventually, you know, move your fist closer and closer and closer until that blockage happens and then it moves past. That's essentially what happened on that day of totality for folks in Erie over the Ohio Valley. And people talked about seeing the shadow come through. It is essentially just a shadow. That's what's funny. So go, going back to maybe your childhood, or you're, you're doing the puppets with um, some type of light in the background, shadow puppets. It's the exact same idea, but it's happening with two huge objects, the sun and the moon. Yeah, that's really neat. Dan, the, what are some of the other changes? I and mean, we hear people say that there, because of that, that blockage, there, there could be temperature changes, um, that colors become more vibrant. What are some of the other things that happen in the eclipse and why do they happen? So temperature all goes back to a simple definition that it's the excitement of molecules initiated by the sun. So you can heat molecules of air very quickly with sunshine. And so if you eliminate that sunshine, all of a sudden you're eliminating that activity a little bit of the air molecules and the temperature comes down. So in, in physics, we say temperature is the average speed or energy of the air molecules. And if you start to limit that speed and energy of air molecules for the atmosphere, even just for a few minutes, temperature will drop. So it happens every day, right? We lose the sun at sunset and all of a sudden temperatures start to tank overnight. The exact same thing happened just on a much smaller scale. So you can imagine going back to ancient times, ancient civilizations that there was probably some panic that in the middle of the day, if an eclipse happened and they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and saw a total eclipse, they might think, my goodness, the world is ending. It shouldn't be turning dark right now. And so that quick little bit of a shadow or darkness actually changes temperature, which then excites a whole other part of meteorology. It actually drops the winds temporarily too. So temperature differences drive the wind. They also drive pressure changes. They're all related. And so when you drop the wind, that could shut down a thunderstorm temporarily. There was um, at least an opportunity for severe weather in Texas that day. And some um, severe weather scientists thought that perhaps this could limit the amount of severe weather if all of a sudden the air cooled and the winds changed thanks to the solar eclipse. So that was all kind of in the background, maybe not a Pennsylvania problem, but things people were talking about on that day that you don't get to see very often as a forecaster. So there were a lot of unique things scientifically that an eclipse brings. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, Dan, the question everybody wants to know, how do those solar eclipse glasses work? Um, and are, is it, if you still have a pair, can you go out, put them on, stare at the sun and see the whole sun? So what's really cool about these glasses, and I think we just missed the opportunity to do this, you could actually see a solar storm, a solar flare um, forming at a sunspot um, just by using those filters. Now, 
I've heard from different um, ops, uh, optical scientists that you really shouldn't be staring at the sun regardless, but there's a special filter within these glasses that will essentially block the damage to your eyes. Because your eyes are trying to focus on very, very bright light, which is something you should never do. You should never stare at a light bulb up close, for instance, for a very long time, let alone the sun. So there's a special filter um, that these glasses use that allow you to view the sun straight on. But even if you have polarized sunglasses, don't look directly at the sun. It is not a good idea. It'll burn your corneas over a short period of time. Um, and so those glasses can still be used any time of the year, anytime we get a sunspot that's visible. And again, we just had one pass by. So we'll see it again as it kind of rotates around. But sunspots are very critical to figuring out space weather and space um, disturbances thanks to the sun. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, I believe, coming up. But um, essentially, you can get solar storms based on the activity of the sun. Again, the sun dictates so much, but a lot of people talk about solar flares in relation to the aurora and the northern lights. Wow, that's really cool. Um, and, and you're right, that's where we're going to head into the next segment. So that's actually just a great place to cut. Uh, let's stop here. We're going to go to the break. Uh, Dan, don't go away. We'll be right back. Face the Issues is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in-house studio productions on demand. Or watch what's on the station right now with our 24-7 live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website for more information. Visit LighthouseTV.org to stay connected. There you can find out what's currently on the air and coming up. How to watch in your area on cable, satellite, broadcast, or streaming devices. Watch past programs or our live stream. Follow us on social media and learn more about the station, our hosts, and our programming. Lighthouse TV, positively different. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Dan, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're going to move from the sun not having light reach Earth to the greatest light show that nature has ever produced, the Northern Lights. I think most viewers know what the Northern Lights are. Uh, we see them in Alaska, in Maine, uh, you know, the further north you go, hence the Northern Lights. But there is this weird phenomenon recently where the Northern Lights were showing up in Pennsylvania and in California and in the Southern United States. Uh, what was happening that caused the Northern Lights to show up at these random places that people never see them? So I think this is a very cool example of how science has progressed to the point that we can actually predict these things within about 24 to 72 hours out um, from happening. And so what we notice is, so there's constant observation of the sun, even though we can't put anyone on the sun, you know, for various um, important reasons. First of all, any spacecraft would burn up as you get very close to it. But we monitor sunspots all the time. And so sunspots are very active areas of the sun that essentially send these pulses of geomagnetic storms out from them. And so when these storms exit the sun, if they are on the path of the earth, it doesn't mean earth is in danger necessarily, but the earth also has magnetism. So at the poles, we have points of magnetism. And so the geomagnetic, geomagnetic storms that interact with our magnetic field and there's so much energy coming from these storms and these solar flares that it excites electrons in our atmospheric air around us. And at night, when that happens, it emits light. So what you're really seeing is photons of light hitting different air molecules and exciting all these different colors and energy releases thanks to that geomagnetic storm. It's really cool. And that's why you can see different colors based on the severity of the storm. Generally speaking, you will see more auroras, more northern lights, the closer you are to the poles, so the north and south pole. But what was really rare just a couple of weeks ago was the strength of, of the geomagnetic magnetic storm. And so scientists don't just study this for the fact that you can see cool colors in the sky and the northern lights. 
this affects satellite technology. This affects anything we put into space. So GPS technology too. I know there were reports of some farm equipment in the Dakotas running around in circles that essentially it had jammed the signals um, for GPS technology. But these huge geomagnetic storms can create huge auroras that can be seen as far south as the tropics. And this was one rare example. I think the last one was in 2003 where we had a severe geomagnetic storm that actually intensified to the extreme level as it was happening. And the timing lined up that people over the Northern hemisphere at night, whether it was in Europe, whether it was in Asia, all the way then westward then into North America could see it as the sun was setting. Unfortunately, as you might know, most areas of Pennsylvania that Friday night were cloudy. I was so disappointed because this was probably our best opportunity since I've been a meteorologist over the last 15 years to have widespread viewing. Now, some people had breaks in the clouds, and if you had a long exposure camera, even iPhones have longer exposure times now, you could get lucky and see maybe some purples and some pinks sneaking through the clouds. But that was about all. Uh, some people as far south as Florida had full views to the naked eye over the horizon. And I, I really wish I could have seen that. Yeah, somehow we ended up with clouds for the solar eclipse and this, <laughs> this solar storm that led to the northern lights. I, I don't know what was up with that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been unfortunate that it's been such an, I mean, for farmers and for gardeners, we've had plenty of opportunity for rain, mm -hmm. but this has been a very active spring with the frequency of rain. And it really bit us in those certain circumstances, whether it's the solar eclipse, some people totally missed it, or it was the Northern Lights. I know I missed it in Harrisburg, um, but there will be more opportunities. Now, will we have one this vibrant and this obvious, this visible? That's hard to say. And so that's what we don't know about the science. We can't do an extended forecast for space weather as of yet, but we can do, like I said, the next few days fairly accurately. So a lot of people, because of the solar eclipse and because of the Northern Lights were exposed to a government agency they've probably never heard of before, but there is the Space Weather Prediction Center. Um, and now even I check it a little bit more on a regular basis as the sunspot comes back around. I'm hoping we get another chance to see the Northern Lights. Yeah, absolutely. Dan, let me ask you about that that magnetic storm, geomagnetic storm you're talking about. Um, you know, we talk about, you hear terms like solar storms or these solar flares. Uh, what, is there a danger to them? You, you mentioned earlier that uh, there was technology that essentially got corrupted or signals got scrambled in this. Uh, what are some of the concerns that are coming? We love seeing the Northern Lights, but what are some of the concerns that come with a storm like this? Yeah, I mean, we rely on a lot of satellite technology, and I know there were certain concerns about how that network would hold up, whether it is GPS, whether it's as simple as communications. Um, I don't know of any widespread issues with that. I do know one of our weather satellites took a brief hit that um, we call the GOES satellite. So it's a geostationary satellite that orbits over the same spot on Earth, taking pictures, taking weather observations. And I know that signal came down for a period of time, but then was restored. So it wasn't like we lost the satellite permanently. And as far as I know, there are fail safes to these products. It's not like there's just one satellite that we're relying upon. But the other thing closer to home are certain radio frequencies can be jammed and can be affected. The same too with power grids. Now again, to my knowledge, I don't know of any widespread issues with the power grids, but you know, we rely on circuit boards, on technology so closely that anything that can excite electrons can um, really push things to their limit. Yeah, it, it's a concern. And I, I think there was some pre-planning on this. This is not something new, mm. but again, when you have such a severe or extreme storm, one we hadn't seen since 2003, I think there was some worry that systems would take a hit. And the, the lights and, and the signals being scrambled, you said it's really caused by the geomagnetic storm, the magnetism mm -hmm. between the poles. Yes. There's, it's a, it, there's no real, like this is not necessarily, like we don't really feel the heat of the sun coming through right. more, or do we? No, no. So yeah, this isn't like a storm the way we think of storms on planet Earth. This is more of, um, stuff you can't see with the naked eye. Again, this mm. is more at the m molecular level. But potentially you could see with those special glasses. Yes. Yeah, so I, I don't know what would happen if you could see the Northern Lights better with the filtered mm. glasses or not. But again, we have such great camera technology, whether it's with the solar eclipse. So 
Um, one thing that was visible with the solar eclipse that not many people have had a chance to photograph is the corona mm -hmm. and then some of the split off, of you will, of some of the energy of the sun. You can kind of see like the little tentacles of the sun's energy around um, the corona. And so we could isolate that with both the filters and cameras. But it's as simple as I mentioned, some of the iPhone cameras now today, and I'm sure some of the Android cameras too, photograph auroras that are not visible to the naked eye. And I've actually seen this before. I think it was two years ago, two summers ago. We have a friend here at ABC 27 who loves to take photography, and he was able to see the northern lights on a fairly weak storm, geomagnetic, geomagnetic storm, um, but it was clear sky here. So you couldn't see it if you looked out yourself, but as soon as he was able to train the lens and the focus the way he needed to with the exposure, it worked magnificently. And I had never seen that before. Yeah, that's something we heard as well. The idea that even if you don't see something, try pointing your phone toward the sky. Uh, and something about just the way it's designed can capture so much more than the human eye can. Yeah, it's pretty wild. So again, I think there will be more chances if you didn't get a chance to see the Northern Lights. And, you know, it used to be people would travel to Norway or to Iceland or northern parts of Canada to get views of this. But as we've seen, we can predict fairly well when the conditions line up that we can see them here, even as far south as Pennsylvania. I know Virginia, some of the isolated areas over the Carolinas away from light pollution they had tremendous views of several of these more recent Northern Lights events. You mentioned that they can kind of track this 42, 72 hour, 48 to 72 hours ahead of time. There has been talk about potentially seeing it again in the fall. How yes. are they tracking that to say that they think, do, do they predict that there's gonna be a storm like this coming in the fall, that, that that's why they're saying this might happen again? So I believe that goes back to the sunspot idea that we can actually track these sunspots and then from the sunspot itself, where that's lining up, you know, again, the, the solar flares are happening all the time. It's just a matter of, does it get aligned with the path with earth? And so I think that's what they're trying to figure out. Where does, this, where does the sunspot line up? And then where does that storm potentially move? What's its path? Does it, in, does it actually affect earth's orbit? Yeah, so this is, it's not, I mean, the eclipse was us not seeing the sun. This is us seeing the sun put on this spectacular light display. But in many ways, it does come back in both cases to alignment. Um, and, and I'm guessing that's why it, these are considered to be rarer phenomena. Exactly. And, the, and the, the alignment has to be perfect. You could have a solar storm in the middle of the day hmm. and you wouldn't be able to see the aurora. So that, that's a perfect example of just timing and alignment. And again, I think these things are happening in the background quite frequently. It's just a matter of when the storms become more severe, the geomagnetic storms, or um, when it aligns at night that we actually get to see the evidence of it. Um, and that's why I think, too, there was some preparation here with the satellites and the technology that, again, they're being bombarded with these geomagnetic waves quite frequently. It's just a matter of the severity of it. It certainly uh, makes us feel small. Uh, when, it does. Right? I think it reminds everyone there's there's more out there than just, you know, us looking at our smartphones scrolling through on planet Earth, right? Yeah, couldn't have said it better. Dan, thank you so much uh, for your sure. insights, for helping us understand these things. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in-house studio productions on demand or watch what's on the station right now with our 24-7 live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Lighthouse TV, positively different. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Dan, thank you again for joining us and for helping us you know, break down what these incredible things that we've gotten to witness this year. Uh, you, last time you were on the show, last summer, uh, you joined us to talk about the smoke. We went from mm -hmm. a smoke show to a light show in a year. Um, and uh, you were talking about the smoke that was coming from these wildfires in Canada. You really helped our viewers understand why the air was so smoky and so forth. Um, not what we're talking about today, but just as we close out, as we're heading into the summer, there is uh, this rumor that we may be in for some more smoke uh, is I mean, What are you seeing? Is that something that we should be concerned about? Yeah, so last year, unfortunately, was a terrible year for wildfires in a lot of rural areas of Canada. So 
about 10 times greater than normal, the size, the sheer size when you add it all together, the wildfires compared to what they typically expect. And so all that smoke based on our weather pattern was coming in from northwest to southeast and you could watch it come in over the Dakotas, you could watch it over areas like Chicago, the Midwest, and then eventually you could watch it move into the mid-Atlantic states. There is unfortunately already fires burning in parts of British Columbia, other parts of Saskatchewan and Alberta, and this seems like already kind of a repeat of what we saw last year. Now, will it be as severe? That's hard to say, but keep in mind a lot of these storms that create wildfires, it's just from lightning. So a lot of this is natural and it should be happening. It's a natural part of any forestry um, science that you need wildfires to essentially burn the old fuel, reignite new life. But when the weather pattern lines up that we get these fronts coming in from the Northwest and big areas of high pressure building in behind them, it comes with the smoke. We've already had reports of smoky days in the Dakotas. Fortunately, this very wet weather pattern in the mid-Atlantic I think has really eased concerns for now. It was a very dry May last year. That contributed to the wildfire problem with smoke kind of just settling in and not leaving the mid-Atlantic. This year so far, rain has been a plenty. If that continues, we may stem the tide a little bit and avoid any worst case scenario. And we really want to do that. I mean, smoke is very, very dangerous, especially when it's at ground level that people don't realize it's the accumulation effect in your lungs that is the problem. It's not just one day. It's when we had those two or three weeks at a time that it became an issue. And real legitimate health concerns, right? Like, like this is, Correct. I mean, I don't want to say it's akin to smoking. I mean, because I know, you know, if you smoke like lifelong, that's that's a long, long, long time. But I mean, you are breathing in fumes, essentially. Yeah. And your body's working overtime to try to pull the oxygen and clean air out of that so-called dirty air. And the Mid-Atlantic in general is a pollution hotspot in the summertime. So then you add smoke into that and it's a problem. I say it's a pollution hotspot because of all the interstates and all the uh, dust and debris that kicks up from combustion. So carbon is a natural part of the combustion process. And we love to run our vehicles and go on vacation, commute to work, that sort of thing. We're adding carbon to the atmosphere already just by our daily activities. And then you have large forest burning to our north and northwest that adds even more carbon um, into the mix and black soot. And that's that's what we're essentially breathing in, unfortunately. Wow. I mean, it, weather, it just it gives us these incredible phenomenon that we've seen and yet also uh, the potential for a smoky summer. Uh, and so, Dan, I, I really appreciate you giving us that preview. Sure. And keep in mind, too, one cool thing with the sun, even though it's wildfire smoke, you get some pretty cool colors. We had some insane sunsets last year and sunrises, those purples, those reds showing up again. The composition of the air is what really makes those colors happen. So keep an eye out for that. If we do get some wildfire smoke, that could be one small benefit, I guess, of seeing it. Yeah, no, that that is that you're right. That's incredible. And, uh, and just such a great reminder of how much is going on around us that we don't know about. Dan, thank you again so much for joining us. Sam, thank you, and thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, always our pleasure. Again, my thanks to Dan Tomasa from ABC27 for joining us, for helping us understand what it is that we're seeing. And my thanks to each of you for tuning in as well. That is our show for this evening. My name is Sam Chan. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.